traditional piercings versus experimental piercings. What's the difference? Why is more important? What works? What doesn't work? Etc. We're going to get into that coming up next on Body Piercing Basics, episode number 68. So stick around. <laughs> For those who are new here, my name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside the Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So when I talk to you about these things, I'm talking about uh, them with a level of expertise and knowledge as someone who has been in the industry for well over 25 years. Actually, technically this month, since I'm recording this in May, 26 years. Went by like that. So what is the difference between the two? To talk about the difference between experimental piercings and traditional piercings, we first have to talk about the history of piercings. Of course, piercing has been with civilization since the very beginning in one way, shape, or form. When we come into the modern age, ear piercings were really acceptable and pretty, continue, uh, pretty common. However, there was a group of individuals, uh, most of them around the Los Angeles area and Southern California, including Jim Ward and Fakur, uh, and et cetera, who slowly began to kind of modernize piercing. There are the godfathers, and they aren't alone. There were other people in other parts of the world and other parts of the country doing many of the same things. Basically, what they were doing is they were taking some traditional knowledge they had of existing piercings. Like, for example, things like septum piercings and nostril piercings and a few of the ear piercings, uh, nipple piercings, uh, genital piercings. These were things that were done in various different cultures over th the history of this world and civilization. So they were kind of building on that. Then there were the ones where they were like, I wonder if this would work. And generally they would work off an idea if it protruded, try piercing it. A lot of this was shot in the dark situations. They didn't have any idea whether or not that piercing would heal correctly or not. A lot of it was underground. A lot of it was just sharing information between people and their experiences. But over time, they started to establish a set of piercings that seemed to work well on a large portion of the population. And then they would feature these in the magazine Piercing Fans Quarterly International. Uh, they would usually have a how-to section in there. Um, and so they kind of rolled out these piercings and revised them as the techniques got better. Most of them, the techniques that we use today were developed by them, including using piercing needles, forceps, hemostats, um, the jewelry. They set the standards for the thickness of the jewelry that seemed to work best or the gauge. Uh, what They set up the diameter. They came up with the designs or styles. Uh, Gauntlet was one of the first jewelry manufacturers. Uh, they're the ones that came out with the posts, uh, labre studs, posts, uh, barbells, rings, catamid rings, uh, in circular barbells. So they kind of established everything. And then we've all kind of built on that foundation that was created there. Over time, people will get bored with traditional piercings and try other things. Um, a lot of the piercings that we have today that we would consider traditional did start out experimental. However, there's a lot of piercings, especially done in this day and age, that I would consider experimental at best or at least high risk. The problem is, is that a lot of, thanks to the internet, you get to see a lot of photos of different piercings. Many of these piercings are bleeding edge experimental, not the best options. However, there's this weird uh, effect of telephone or whatever you want to call it, where it seems like these piercings are commonplace because you see so many photos of them. The problem with photos is that usually they are taken immediately afterwards. If you begin to look at the piercing up close and pixel pick, peek if you can, you'll notice there'll be redness around in discolorization and maybe a little bit of marker left. That's because this these pictures are often taken less than a minute or two after the piercing has stopped bleeding. It's not a good gauge of how well that piercing is actually going to heal. 
So let's get into it. What is the difference between traditional piercings and experimental piercings, in my opinion? Traditional piercings would basically fall under that, if it protrudes, pierce it. If it has a long track record, pierce it. Most of the piercings that I do have been being done for over three to four decades. P thousands upon thousands, if not millions of people have healed out these piercings without issue. A basic list of traditional piercings would be things like most of the ear piercings, nostril piercings, septums, lip piercings or liberate piercings, uh, upper lip piercings, tongue piercings, eyebrow piercings, nipples, navel, uh, most of the female and male genital piercings, and I won't go through and name every single one of them, most of them are established in traditional piercings. Experimental piercings, on the other hand, are things like surface-to-surface -surface piercings, single-point piercings, also known as dermal implants or subdermal implants or microdermals or whatever they've come up with this week. Um, surface-to-surface -surface piercings, piercings that are done in areas of the body where it is flat or just slightly rounded. Um, anything that's really just kind of on that edge of possibilities. Even some of the traditional piercings are more at risk than other piercings, especially piercing groupings or piercings like industrials that combine multiple pieces of jewelry or one single piece of jewelry. However, there's still that kind of standard of, yes, you can heal this, lots of people have, um, it may be more probatic, but it's got a good chance of healing. Part of this comes down to my philosophy when it comes to body piercing. If I do a piercing on you, I want a piercing or I want to provide a piercing that I know if you wish you can have for the rest of your life. It shouldn't be something that's only going to last a couple of months or a couple of years and then fall out or have some massive problem that will make you remove the jewelry. Why is it so important to know the difference? Basically, it's important to know the difference because you need to understand the risks going into these particular types of piercings. I have no issue if you are well-educated, know your body, know what you can handle, know what your, your uh, piercer's experience level is, and et cetera. But you should know that from the beginning that, for example, a dermal on your cheek is much more riskier uh, as far as problems than, say, a nostril piercing is. And the problem is, is often people do not have that impression because they see these piercings on multiple people in multiple locations. So let's get into experimental. I would group experimental piercings into basically four groups. First one being is single jewelry, multiple piercings or groupings. Uh, these are things like industrials, orbitals, uh, the uh, various different ear piercings that are done where it's multiple piercings and one piece of jewelry is used. There are other places in the body where people have experimented with this, but every time we do one of these, it really has to fit to the anatomy and there's always a chance. I would say that industrials are probably the least riskiest, but they have their own set of problems that you should always know about ahead of time. However, I have seen people that are connecting nostril piercings to septums or um, trying to connect uh, multiple lip piercings or stuff like that. These piercings are experimental and you should know that going in. They may or may not work. The next one is surface to surface piercings. It seems like this is a type of piercing that comes and goes into fashion or out of fashion and into fashion multiple times every four or five years. Surface to surface piercings are done in areas of the body that are not as protruding. Like, for example, the big hot one right now is the surface to surface trachis. Basically, it's done through a flat surface with a barbell usually kind of shaped like a very shallow U or, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of like a shallow U. Flat on the bottom with two, two balls that stick out on both sides. These are not new. This is nothing new. This is not stuff that hasn't been done before. Service to service piercings have been with piercing from probably the very beginning. Uh, some of the most common ones are probably like nape of the neck. Uh, though there are people that have tried to pierce the back of their arms, their pecs, uh, their hands, and just about everywhere else. These do not normally work. They're very prone to migration. They're very prone to rejection. 
they do work on a specific part of the population that seems more tolerant to this type of thing. However, not everybody is. So you should always walk in understanding that in advance. The next type is pocketing or single point piercing or microdermal. Basically in this, you're doing kind of a surface to surface thing, but instead of making, uh, putting the jewelry under the skin, what you're doing is you're making one point incision and then uh, inserting a piece of jewelry in a pocket of below uh, the skin and then having your body grow a pocket around that and into that anchor. These have mixed results. Some people have had them for decades and never had issues with them. Other people, it seems like it's around two years until the thing gets snagged just right and then starts migrating and rejecting for the body. Everybody's different, but it has its own set of issues, including you can't remove the jewelry and then reinsert it. So that creates problems with medical situations, emergencies, and et cetera. It is in there permanently or you remove it. There's no in between. The last of these is play piercings or temporary piercings. These are generally done for the experience more than the long-term uh, use of the piercing. Uh, if jewelry is even inserted, it's only inserted for a short period of time. Probably the most common or most uh, well seen or what have you would be the corset style piercings that are done on the back uh, with rings and then ribbon is intertwined between them. Everybody thinks when they see this the first time that it's some type of permanent thing. It isn't. Usually those are done the photos are taken or the conventions attended and then at the end of it they remove the jewelry because it would migrate or reject out and leave additional scars. Also play piercings are done in various different sexual activities where the needles are inserted and then removed once that particular activity is over. With that out of the way, let's move on to the risks. What are the risks of experimental piercings? The biggest one is rejection, that your body's just gonna flat out say, nope, I'm not doing this, I'm done with this idea, I'm gonna push this jewelry out. Once your body feels like it can do that, it can leave a lot of scarring. The second thing is that the piercing may never heal. Um, it'll be like an open wound for an extremely long period of time. Your body just know, doesn't ever seem to click into this idea of, hey, I can grow tissue around this and close it out and not have to worry about infection and then I'll deal with getting rid of this foreign object later. It just flat out just keeps acting like it's an open wound and it never starts to fully heal. The last one being scarring. If you think about it, if you take an inch long uh, or three quarter inch or half inch long surface bar, put it underneath your skin, and over the next four or five months, your body slowly starts to migrate and push it out. You're going to have a scar that's going to be roughly anywhere from, well, if you have, a, let's say, a half-inch barbell in there, service barbell, you can add another eighth of an inch to that. So you're going to have a five-eighths long scar down, uh, well, in your trachis, right in front of your trachis right here, or wherever you did that at. Um, this is going to be permanent. There's no way to soften it. They will fade over time. But... If you consider where you're getting the piercing done at and the fact that it may be on your face, it might be something you want to consider beforehand. And speaking about considering things beforehand, what are the things you should consider in research before getting an experimental piercing? The first one being is the risk of causing prolonged damage. This is especially true of lip piercings and oral piercings and etc. What falls in this line would be Ashley piercings, which uh, is just asking to destroy your front teeth. Uh, for those who don't know what Ashley piercings are, they're done just like a labret, but they're done into the lip, right in right where your, where your teeth come together. Other ones that would be in this direction would be like dimple piercings or uh, Dela piercings, things that are at the edge of the mouth um, and various other ones. Uh, as far as permanent damage in other parts of your body, of course, if you do piercings through your hand that involve going behind the tendon, it can cause severe problems. Gum piercings can cause severe problems. Uh, anytime you go deep, there is always that possibility, which is what 
most service to service piercings are prone to do. They'll try to go deeper to keep it from uh, being rejected. In most cases, you can damage the tissue depending on where it's located at. So you should research that beforehand, research other people's experiences and learn through them. You are not gonna be more than likely the special person that doesn't have the issues. The second one would be is what's the rejection rate? This one's kind of hard to say because piercers tend to hide their mistakes. They don't publicize them. They don't like admitting it. And there's a lot of ego involved. Also, people that wear piercings are rarely going to post photos of their rejected trache antitrachus piercing or what have you, or, you know, service service trachus. God, that's a mouthful. Or their anti-eyebrow. What they're going to do is they're going to post it when it's new, and then they're never going to post anything about it again. Research it. There is various different places on the internet where you can find people that love to share experiences. Ask people that you know that have had it and get a detailed analysis of how well that success rate really is. The next one being, and I've already talked about scarring, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, is finding out how much scarring is usually involved with that particular piercing. Is it going to be a lot of scarring? Is it going to be a little bit of scarring? Is it something you live with, especially with the location of the piercing? Uh, is it going to be just a small indentation scar or is it going to be something much larger? You should know this in advance and understand that it may be you that that piercing rejects on and you that ends up living with that scar tissue. This is a big one. What is the proper jewelry when doing that piercing? I don't know how many surface to service experimental piercings, et cetera, that I have seen that have been done with the wrong type of jewelry. They've been done with curved barbells instead of uh, surface to surface barbells. They've been done with standard barbells instead of surface to surface piercings or barbells. Find out exactly what works best and what should be put in there. Uh, yeah, you're trusting your piercer to know his stuff or her stuff, but sometimes it might come down to what they have in stock more than actually their knowledge about that piercing. The next one is, is there any additional steps that you're going to need to take to ensure that piercing heals? And when I'm talking about this, a lot of it comes down to locations. Think through where it's located at and how much contact that area has with your with other parts of your body, other people, bedding, the car, what have you. The reason why I bring this up is often people don't consider that, that there's going to be additional steps they're going to have to take. For example, maybe you didn't have any issue healing out a conch piercing. Well, that's great and wonderful. But if you have a dermal implant on, let's say, your cheek, it's going to come in contact with a lot of other stuff that that conch piercing didn't. You need to really research what is going to be involved and think about it. Like, for example, if you're going to get dimples on your back, are you going to be able to sit straight up without having any contact with your back while you're sitting, driving, eating, talking, etc.? And is it going to be an issue? The other thing is to consider other piercings that you've had. If you are one of those people that is prone to having issues healing out what would be considered traditional piercings, then experimental piercings are just going to probably be 10 times worse. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Um... Even with the best effort, the best uh, aftercare instructions, the what have you, if you are prone to problems with, let's say, uh, it's kind of like roulette. Let's say you had an, an, an eyebrow piercing and it migrated. If you had that problem with an eyebrow piercing, you're definitely going to have that problem if you do the nape of your neck or an anti-eyebrow or, or something that's surface to surface. Your body does have that uh, that need to reject foreign objects. It doesn't accept jewelry easily. The next one is, what is your piercer's experience level with this particular piercing? Have they done a lot of them? Have you seen photos of them healed? Have they? Have you talked to one of their clients that healed one of these piercings out? Have they done a lot of them? Do they have the proper jewelry on hand because they do a lot of them? If they don't have the proper jewelry on hand, chances are they've never done it before or they rarely do it because they can't afford to stock the additional jewelry because they don't sell it. The last one is very important. Always have a pre-piercing consultation with your piercer. Do your research. Have questions ready and talk to them about the risks that are involved with the piercing, the success, 
the jewelry choices, etc. Ask a lot of questions. Ask them if they feel comfortable doing this parasite. I, for one, will not do anything that I consider off the beaten path on anybody until I've done multiple piercings on them and they've healed them out easily. Even then, you're going to probably have to sit down with me four or five times to convince me to do the piercing in the first place. I don't like doing experimental piercings for the same reason I do not like experimenting on my clientele. It isn't fair. I'm providing a professional service, and if I don't know what the hell I'm doing, then it isn't very professional. I hope you found this informative. Uh, that's about all I have to say on the subject today. I know it was a bit long and kind of dry, but this is a subject that'll be debated till the end of time of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And if it wasn't for those people that are pushing that bleeding edge, we would not have developed the type of jewelry we have today, the way we heal piercings and the aftercare methods and et cetera. If somebody out there hadn't thought, well, why isn't that possible? And then proven, yeah, it's possible. And a lot of times there's mistakes involved. Things don't go well. But the person who got it done may be okay with that because they knew that going in. It always comes down to this. Do what you want to do, but do it educated. Find out the problems. Find out the risk. Know your stuff beforehand. Don't come to somebody six months after you've gotten that thing done and it's falling out of you and yell and scream at them for doing that to them, to you. Know beforehand what the risks are and be able to accept those risks before you get the piercing. Well, uh, if anybody has any ex uh, questions, concerns, etc., feel free to leave a comment, especially if you had experience with some of the more extreme piercings out there and had good experiences and bad experiences. Sharing that knowledge with other people is going to help other people. And that's one of the, the goals of this channel is to kind of create that type of community where we share information. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. Let me know what you like it because I like it when you like it. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you're notified every single time we post something. If you like swag, you like clothes, you like tote bags, you like stickers and et cetera, check out our merch store. Uh, there's a merch bar below and also the link is in the description. Lots of fun designs there and lots of different types of merch for you to buy. Till next time. Here's hoping all your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see if your body piercing needs in the future. Stay safe, everybody. Stay clean, stay well, and stay healthy so we can make it through this uh, pandemic and move on to normal life. Till then, take care.